So here we are in Pax Britannica, um, moving into 1884 turn. <coughs> Roll the random events for the turn. I've got to do the admin. One is upheaval in Russia. That means the Russians are going to get no colonial office. Big cut in money. They were set up, you know, to get the 30 bucks a turn because they haven't expanded anywhere yet. Well, now they're not going to get that. It's one of the costs for, uh, you know, not having already entrenched yourself with real... Uh, interests beyond interests and influence and then South Africa pressures uh, for Dominion the British player has to give uh, South Africa Dominion status you almost never want to do these things but if they don't do it they lose five victory points five victory points for them is 50 money over a period of time now the cost for this is 20 possession to Dominion goes 20 bucks <clears throat> that may not be worthwhile. It may be worth taking the hit in political in, in victory points rather than giving a dominion status. The only thing that contravenes that is if I want to keep an army present in in the Cape Colony. In which case well, that whatever advantage I get from that. It's something I won't do without paying for this. But if I do want to keep a decent-sized force there or a navy there or whatever, it is a nice location. I like Cape Colony for uh, out of the choices of the different dominions. This is the one that I most am willing to take in some ways. I say Australia. Well, the truth of the matter is this gets me on the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, the Atlantic's probably not too important, but it's the South Atlantic. So if I get blockaded in the North Atlantic, I can actually have multiple forces in those places. Um, and it gives me position, uh, a good uh, supply source, which is something Australia and New Zealand don't do. Australia and New Zealand give you a supply source, but it's one that only is effective if you cut the main waterways but leave the Brits in control of the Asian waterway. Here, I can expand my routes through Africa from the Cape Colony and end up getting a significant, you know, and end up having this uh, single kind of block of supply there without having to worry about naval supply. That's appealing too. I may just do it because of those military factors. All right, on to the admin. Well, looking at the uh, monetary situation, most of the countries improved kind of as they usually do in the game. See, France boosted itself up into the 80s with the withdrawal of troops and the increase of, uh, you know, some, some economic interests instead. <clears throat> Uh, even Italy didn't do too bad raising up into the 40s. Russia obviously fell behind even Belgium in terms of the money that they're producing because of the no colonial office. Even little things like Austria and Germany all increasing up into the 50s. Britain did not make as big a jump as they usually do. They were very conservative because of that first turn boil over issue about pulling troops home. They're probably going to pull more home, or if they build this dominion, make this the center of where they keep kind of their eastern uh, allocation of forces, because that won't cost them anymore to keep them there. Um, but yeah, other than that, not a lot there. The miners were all active. The Dutch over here, the Bismarck Archipelago, the ex leaving of the Germans. The Dutch are more interested in territories over there, I guess. Those aren't worth much. They're not really taking anything away from anyone. Uh, Portugal ended up in the Congo. And Spain took Marat. Whoa, I'm sorry about that. This damn camera is getting crappier. Uh, Spain took Morocco as a protectorate. Again, a five-point area. This is, there are plenty of them around the board. This isn't putting a squeeze on anyone, but later in the game, there aren't many places Spain's going to advance to that they can gain control of. This is, in fact, their... Uh, oh, they've got... No, they don't use this counter. They, they took a counter from their pool. They don't use that. They use one of their excesses over here. Out of Cuba. Um... 
But yeah, Spain, they don't have to roll to get their successes, but there, there's not a lot of places these miners are going to expand to. Um, hmm. Actually, Portugal expands into the Congo. They don't just do that. And we've got a problem. The world will probably, well, England may object. And they may be able to get Belgian help on that objection. But basically the world is kind of pleased about this idea that these two are going to get Cassus Belli there. Because Portugal is now dominating into the Congo the way Belgium often does. <clears throat> the miners have an advantage in doing this, but when there's an influence in there, it becomes a tougher call. All right, well... Now it's time to go into the main phase of the play, and I won't be covering that in detail the way I did. I'll probably just come and show you what happened. Partway through the placement, uh, and things are kind of getting interesting. The French kind of convinced the Germans into a, hey, let's take Britain down on, the, on this early turn. Because the Brits went into Tanganyika, where the French were already uh, trying to establish a protectorate. Okay. Well... Germany is saying to itself, I, I can't really afford to go to war without sort of a cause. I'm going to, you know, what, what happens if maybe this doesn't work out, if the war doesn't happen, if Britain backs down, I want to gain something anyway. So they went and grabbed uh, Nigeria, which is a six value place. There aren't a lot of choices open Germany's got kind of a problem. Anyhow, though, the Japanese are expanding into Korea, and somebody probably wants to do something about that. Uh, normally, I see that fall to Japan and Russia as a co-dominion on the first turn. With these new rules, with the co-dominions um, reducing in effectiveness if you, by sharing them, reducing their value by one for each additional person in them, well... That becomes less appealing to the Japanese. They don't mind giving a bonus to Russia if it doesn't cost them. But if it's going to cost them, well, the Japanese army is bigger. So they went in alone. We're going to see what happens there. Uh, and now, with this German-French-Anglo tension, the Italians jump back into Egypt with an army. All right, well, after the end of the placement phase, things started getting ugly. There were discussions and everything that started causing some real problems. What it looks like it's ending up as is France and Italy against England. Italy doesn't have a huge navy, but France has built theirs up. There's also an interesting situation going on with Portugal. Portugal went and grabbed the Congo. Um, Britain has a Cassis Belli, which they don't necessarily want to use. Belgium has one, which they're planning on stating, yeah, we're not withdrawing, which will force Portugal to withdraw unless somebody declares they're supporting Portugal. If somebody declares they're supporting Portugal, then Belgium has to decide what they're doing. That could end up with them involved in one of these wars. They built their army up as much as they can. They don't have a lot of points left because while they could inject themselves somewhere else, they're really interested in the Congo. That's their key place. Uh, the Brits also, they dropped themselves in a couple of places. They're not giving dominion to uh, South Africa, so they're going to lose five victory points for that. Um, but they and the French have been building up navies. That's affected uh, European tensions, at least by one. The French built another navy. They built some more earlier. Uh, which have driven tensions up. So tensions right now are up to 12, which isn't huge, you know, very high at this point in the game. The second turn, of course, if the war happens, that will drive them up quite a bit. Um, we also have a possibility of a war between Russia and Japan. Russia built up her army. She's now got 20 army points there. Doesn't have enough money to upgrade into a co-dominion, so basically her insistence is, Japan, get out of there, and Japan is going to say no. So there's almost a guaranteed war going to happen there. I think there's going to be one between the, the uh, Franco-Italian and the British as well, uh, just because of the circumstances. Japan, I can't see them jumping into that. They're pretty much committed to this war. The U.S. doesn't want to get involved. If they had more armies 
If they had built properly for this war, they could be a threat to Canada, which would be a major, major blow, obviously, to the uh, United Kingdom. Um, the biggest... Then there's kind of this buildup of navies down here, too. The English sent three, the French sent two. Um, those could be withdrawn, whatever. But it looks like the big naval war is going to be in the Mediterranean. And then whatever comes of this might be an overspill from that. Uh, we'll see. I'm pretty sure we're going to war this turn, though. Uh, going to handle the colonial combat. Some of those might fail, which, of course prevent a Cassus Ballet from happening. England was considering sticking its nose in down here in Egypt, which when it started making noises about that is when Italy got driven over into the French camp. Now Italy doesn't really feel as compelled. What they'd like to do is avoid a war here, but still keep Egypt. We'll see how this all works out. England certainly was considering putting in there. I don't know what they did instead. Uh, but somehow they got threatened out, out of it. Hmm. And Austria has reached sort of the extent of its expansion. It's got uh, influence in these two spaces. It doesn't have shipping capability, so this is as far as it can go unless it gets physical control of either Serbia or uh, Romania. And if it gets those, then it kind of gets into Bulgaria uh, and potentially even Turkey. Well, a Congress of Europe has been called in Germany. They're the only... European non-participant. Nobody was really interested in having the uh, Americans show up. The Japanese and Russians are in, well, the Japanese are in it over the Japanese-Russian struggle. Even though there's no way that's going to get resolved, both powers want a war there. Um, no, the only peaceful resolution that the rest of the world would try to impose is, hey, Japan, r reduce yourself to an influence. Um, they're clearly not going to go with that. Uh, England tries to float that kind of argument, but to tell you the truth, nobody else really wants to vote for it because they don't want the, uh, the obvious Japanese flaunting of it to raise European tensions. The issue over here, though, in Africa as a whole, that showed some promise. Germany brought in as sort of the honest broker holding the thing, said, hey, look, I see an answer. Now, Germany is acting in this position because they don't want tensions to go up from a war. They want more time to build up their own strength so that they can challenge a Britain or a France. And what they see is whoever wins the French-British war, and maybe Italy if they're on, on the French side, and Belgium if they're on, on the English side. It's ended up Belgium and England. Um, Portugal is being supported by the French. So this Portuguese protectorate has become part of this war. Uh, both England and France have a good reason to stay out of it. They're about at parity. Italy doesn't see too much advantage at all, but both have paid a everybody's paid a price here. France has reduced an influence in Egypt for Italy's uh, support here. They had to remove that in order. They probably should have left it there if it's going to Congress, because who knows, some kind of deal could have been worked out otherwise. But anyway, the proposed deal that Germany put forward was that England gets upgraded to a co-dominion of a protectorate in Egypt. That England removes itself from other areas, that Belgium removes itself. So France ends up getting Tanganyika. Germany feels pretty happy with what they've gained. They're okay with Cameroon and, and what uh, Niger, Nigeria here. Uh, that's the U.S. down there. We slipped into Cameroon. Uh, it's Kenya. I don't know what I said. Oh, boy, this map is pissing me off because it's so... Uh, these Victory Games maps, when they get a little damp, and I don't know when this one did, maybe just through age, it gets very poochy. So I should probably have some plexi over this, but my only piece would ruin the, the look completely. It's this kind of foggy, cracked thing back there. Um, anyway, the Brits have been intransigent. They're not willing to step back uh, from their position. They might be convinced if they were elevated into both these areas. <sighs> Influences turning into protectorates. France feels like, look, I got an even fight on you. I don't think they're willing to do it. I'll give them one last chance. 
Oh, yeah, they're willing. They're willing. So I think Germany's just solved the issue because France is willing to allow England to elevate here. And that basically means Belgium's going to have to, uh, well, see, if Belgium goes to war with Portugal, they're also at war with France. And that's a war they can't win. What advantage does it give France to allow Belgium to have Portugal? Very little except some diplomatic edge. So pretty much everybody's going to withdraw. We are going to see a little war over in Korea, though. Okay, I'll uh, reposition everything based on the Congress. I can't believe France backed down. Okay, so we had some status markers downgraded that, right? We had two downgraded there. Um, that's two more European tensions. We're up to 20. It's pretty healthy. <coughs> Russia's declaring war on Japan. Japan has no allies. During the negotiation phase, everyone saw them as kind of toxic, or Russia for that matter, because there's too many other wars going on. So Japan quickly declares war for five. Now some sort of, or Russia declares war for five. So some kind of secret treaty could have been in effect here, but it wasn't. The treaties we have aren't going to generate any victory points. Italy and uh, France, Britain and Belgium of all, those certainly aren't. Uh, nobody wanted to touch Russia or Japan, even though maybe there were points available or something. The U.S. has none. Uh, so, we hit that declaration of war. Now, the first thing we do is instead of, we're way down here. Oop, Chinese resentment, I forgot to add my points. Uh, I think I may have, actually. My points for uh, the established possession, that's five more points. I'm pretty sure I added them already. So, Chinese resentment's up in the 30s at this point with what happened. And now, we're going to roll off. Let's give Japan the yellow die, Russia the red one. Whoever rolls higher gets the initiative, which means they'll go first in the war phase. So the Japanese are going to get the first move. And very quickly, I mean, not a lot happens here. The Japanese have some armies present already, but they don't want them sitting there when the Russians come in. So they're going to pull them back into their shipping. And then they're also going to throw all of these down there. So they have some 28 strength points. Now the Russians, if the Japanese had stayed there, the Russians would have to fight them. But they're going to send 20 strength points. They have to leave 30 in Europe. And they go and they conquer Korea. Now, the Japanese don't have 30. They can, they can get... Uh, that would be three to two. So the best they can do is a one-to-one -one attack. We'll go in there with everything, with two tens. Um, mainly, you could send more in. It would still be a one-to-one, -one, but that more would help if there's an exchange. But now, there's no modifiers, no terrain, nothing like that. We just do a roll on the one-to-one -one attack. We get a four. That's a green, that's a half exchange. Um, Oh, we did want to send an extra strength point in because I forget about that half exchange thing. So we are sending that extra strength point in. Yeah, I'm cheating. Um, the smaller force is eliminated. That's the Russians. And so they've just lost the war. And the larger force takes half that loss. So the Japanese lose 10. And the war is really over. Uh, Russia could demand that it continue for two more turns, but they're going to just sign a peace at this point to prevent uh, things from going any further on the European tensions. And basically each turn in the war um, costs us two more. So there's going to be one turn in that war goes two. So the Japanese hold Korea over the course of that whole thing. And well, Russia's lost a lot of uh, money and manpower that they threw into those ar well money that they threw into those armies. This wasn't a great turn for anyone yet. Um, you know, France thought oh, I'm going to get San uh, Tanganyika kind of sleazing. Germany got a good turn. Germany got two protectorates, and now that means that they're not going to get their colonial offices anymore. 
but they have a land presence on the board. They can start producing some money from that. Their big goal, though, has got to be, as it always is, build up the German army so that it can challenge a Britain or a France, um, or at least be a weight, a counterweight, so that they can add to it. Italy, we saw, was able to do that with very little. Actually, it's not so much the German army as the German navy that's important. There are no territories connected to Germany, so the German army itself is like the British army or anyone else's. Only Austria and Russia uh, and to some extent the United States, have this capability to do a land move into an area of some importance. Everyone else has to rely on naval, so it's their fleets that are absolutely vital to them. All right, uh, so we're done with the uh, war. Japan, I believe, is allowed to reposition its forces so it can pull back so it's only got one unit in place, and we'll go to the victory point record phase and take care of the rest of that. And as the turn ends and we move into the next one, which is going to be 1888. Put these down for the new powers to decide what they're doing with. Uh, victory point wise, Belgium had a pile of money. They get to buy victory points at one point each. They put 25 bucks into their victory points. Now, I think Belgium's kind of unfair in that sense. I think they've got a good chance of winning the game without doing anything. I really don't think that they were a balanced choice to add to the game, and I'm kind of thinking that the game probably plays better without the minute, to tell you the truth. Uh, they, didn't, they haven't gained anything. They haven't done anything that they couldn't automatically do. Uh, they can invest everywhere and just throw their money into those victory points all game long at no cost. They're not an interesting choice as a major power in terms of, um, in terms of play, and I think they may have too good a chance of winning because the usual tactics of this game the bullying around and stuff don't work on somebody who can just put interests and uh, influence markers down in safe places and score lots and lots of points for them. Um, on the bright side, there aren't a lot of Belgian fleets at first, but they get two more listed on there to allow them to get into places like China and stuff where there's some big money there. This is, uh, this is problematic, I think. Um, I can remove these. Britain, of course, got their big minus four, which I marked down. And I'm going to load this one up. Start the next turn. Record sheets are becoming a pain in the butt for me at this point. I think it's just a point in my life where they're becoming difficulty. difficult. Uh, I'm having much, much more trouble keeping track of the changes on the sheets than I used to, be, than I used to have. I don't know. All right, up it goes.